Tonight we're actually reaching a little further back. The reason the Long Now Foundation describes the Long Now as the last 10,000 years and the next 10,000 years, and we're building a clock to sort of tell time for the next 10,000 years. The last 10,000 years refers to what happened 10 millennia ago when the most radical thing that humanity did for itself and to the planet was invent agriculture. It was a ferocious, everything-changing event. It changed carrying capacity for humans. It affected carrying capacity for all the other species that we have. And that process has been revolutionary from decade to decade and century to century and millennium to millennium up until this very day. One of the reasons I'm particularly interested in this book um, that this couple has done Pamela Ronald and Raul Adamczak, is that it is taking two current revolutions, the organic one and the genetic engineering one, which are usually seen as being in opposition and slamming them together, which is exactly the kind of thing that farmers and growers and marketers have been doing for 10,000 years. It's figuring out new angles. Farming is hard, it's the hardest work there is. It's a very chancy profession. Uh, most people don't really go into farming to make money. They go into farming to make food. These guys, I think, have an unusually realistic handle both on the present of how food crops work and especially on the future. Please, wel please welcome Pam and Raul. That was great. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart, for that nice introduction. And thank you, Danielle, and the rest of the Long Now organizers for, for bringing us here and for putting on this fabulous seminar series. And thank all of you for coming out on a Tuesday night. So. We don't go out on Tuesday nights in Davis. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. So you may think organic farmers and geneticists represent opposite ends of the agricultural spectrum. You may even think that we don't talk to each other, but we do, and it's not that difficult. The reason is we both have the same goal, which is an ecologically based farming system. Still, many of our friends and family have asked us if genetically engineered crops are safe to eat and if they will harm our environment. And many of our scientific colleagues have asked us if organic agriculture can produce enough food to feed uh, the world's growing population. So this book is our response to those questions. And what we try to do in the book is give the reader a better understanding of what geneticists and organic farmers actually do day to day, and also to distinguish between fact and fiction on the debate on crop genetic engineering. <coughs> One of the other things that organic farmers and genetic engineers have in common is that uh, they read uh, the Whole Earth Catalog 30 years ago <laughs> and, and came away with the idea that there was an appropriate technology for solving problems in the world. And we still carry these, the, this idea, as well as the book, with us uh, today. And uh, you know, I've, uh, I've literally had this book, this catalog, since it came out, and I didn't realize that I was holding on to it so I could get uh, the editor to autograph it tonight. <laughs> okay. So the, the, the place that Pam and I start off with is a look at the problems of conventional agriculture. And when you look at what kind of agriculture we have now, it's obvious that there are a lot of pesticides used, there are synthetic fertilizers used, and there are farming practices that result in a lot of uh, uh, soil erosion, both in the US and around the world. California is a somewhat unique state because it keeps track of pesticide use. 
And you can see from this graph that pesticide use in California uh, hasn't changed a great deal in the last 10 years, despite the fact that there have been a lot of efforts to reduce pesticide use, and there have been a few changes. There are some less toxic pesticides being used, and some uh, more toxic ones have been banned. But there's also considerably less farmland in California than there was uh, 10 years ago. But still, pesticide use uh, uh, continues. And uh, the environmental problem with, with pesticides is that not only do, do they kill pests, but they kill beneficial insects, they kill birds, they kill uh, worms, they kill uh, beneficial microbes uh, that are on leaf surfaces and in the soil. And in California, of course, we have a, um, a rigorous uh, pesticide uh, safety system. And uh, pesticide applicators are trained uh, on how to use uh, and apply materials safely, although nevertheless, each year there are 1,000 or so pesticide-related poisonings in, in uh, California. But in the rest of the world, there aren't these safety programs. Here's a, a, a Peruvian potato farmer uh, without gloves, without a respirator. He's applying pesticides. Uh, it's clear that in the rest of the world, there are uh, an estimated 3 million cases of severe pesticide poisoning that result in 300,000 deaths. That outside of California, it's even a bigger problem the other aspect of uh, conventional agriculture is that it, it depends uh, very heavily on synthetic fertilizers. And sy uh, synthetic fertilizers uh, <clears throat> have two main problems. One, synthetic nitrogen is made from natural gas, and it's very energy intensive. It, it, it takes the equivalent of 30 gallons the energy equivalent of 30 gallons of gasoline to make the amount of nitrogen it takes to plant a field of corn in the Midwest. Uh, if you look at that globally, 1% uh, of uh, energy in the world is used to make uh, synthetic nitrogen. And as far as the plants go, the plants like uh, synthetic nitrogen because uh, it's readily available to be taken up by the plant um, to be used to grow. But the downside is, because it's so soluble, it leaches out of the field. And to give you um, a sense of how much leaches out, the uh, nitrogen use efficiency for plants is about 50%. So 50% is taken up uh, by the plant, and 50% goes into groundwater, surface water, or into the air. Uh, when it goes into uh, surface water, uh, it, uh, <coughs> it causes algae to bloom. And when the algae die, bacteria break it down. And when the bacteria do this, they take all the oxygen out of the water. So here is a, um, here's a slide of the Gulf of Mexico. And I think that's an oil platform in the background. This is a... a a slide of the Gulf of Mexico where on one side you have basically a dead zone that lacks oxygen, nothing can live there, and on the other side you have uh, the uh, living, living Gulf of Mexico. The uh, site at the Gulf of Mexico is often 6,500 uh, square miles that forms each year from the agricultural runoff from you know, Iowa and Kansas and Ohio and all those Midwestern states. Um, but it's only one of 250 of these, of these sites that are in the U.S. Uh, you know, the Chesapeake Bay has problems um, and other waterways around, um, around the country. This is a satellite photo of that, uh, of that uh, dead zone that forms, and you can see the extent of it as it comes out of the mouth of the Mississippi. And if you think that uh, world fertilizer use is going down, actually it's still going up, 
and this little blip at the, uh, at the top of Russia, that was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, uh, Russia is now using as much fertilizer as they were. And you can see that it's not only a problem in the US, it's a problem worldwide. Uh, Asia is using a tremendous amount of synthetic fertilizers, um, as well as uh, the US and Russia and Europe. The third tremendous problem that agriculture faces is soil erosion. This is a map of the globe that shows soil erosion from around the world. And the dark orange spots are the very degraded soil areas. Uh, because of soil erosion, 30% of the world's arable land has become unproductive. And when soil erodes, you know, it just ends up in rivers and streams and lakes and all the nutrients and all the pesticides in the soil also end up in rivers and streams and lakes. And if you'd like a close-up look of, what, of, uh, of soil erosion, this is farmland in Iowa. And uh, the conventional farming practice is, is to uh, leave the ground bare until the crop is planted. So you get a lot of rain when the ground is bare and it just runs off. Um, it's estimated that as a, as a result of erosion, global, global cropland shrinks by more than 10 million hectares e each year. And I've seen uh, other estimates that are as high as 20 million hectares e uh, each year. So it's an it's a ongoing and continuing problem. Um, the um, recent estimate on um, soil erosion in the US is that 1.8 billion tons of soil are lost from US soils each year. The number in China is 4.5 billion tons. So um, the situation is actually worse in other parts of the world than it is here. So what's the future of agriculture if we continue with these farming practices? What are our children going to inherit from us? What sort of situation are they going to face um, in the next 50 to 80 years? Um, well, there's going to, if, if we continue farming the way we are now, there's going to be more polluted environments. There, uh, are going, there's going to be less wildlands because we're going to need uh, more cropland to produce more food. Um, and there's going to be global conflict because uh, if people aren't fed, then it's, uh, it's one of the uh, most common causes for unrest in the world. So starting from this point of these very serious problems, Pam and I developed some criteria for a more sustainable agriculture. And obviously, we want to provide abundant, safe, and nutritious food because that's what, uh, that's what the world needs. Uh, clearly, we want to reduce um, harmful environmental inputs, pesticides, and fertilizers. We want to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture um, because of global warming. And uh, the agricultural problems are just as great as the global warming problem, and they're, they're, they're also tied uh, together. We want a system that, that reduces soil erosion, but also uh, fosters soil uh, fertility. Uh, the US right now is uh, eroding soil 10 times faster than it's being produced or made. And in China, they're eroding soil 40 times faster than it's being, being uh, produced. So we need to reduce that trend. Um, it's very important to uh, enhance crop genetic diversity. Uh, one of the greatest losses of, uh, um, of crop was in 1970 to the uh, southern corn leaf blight where 710 million bushels of corn was lost to a disease because the uh, genetic diversity of the, uh, of the corn crop was so narrow that the, the, uh, the disease caused a tremendous problem. 
It's also critical to maintain the economic viability of farmers in rural community because without farmers, there's just not going to be enough food. We want to protect biodiversity to provide the habitat for beneficial insects and birds. And we want to uh, improve the lives of the poor and malnourished around the world, one, because it's our responsibility to do so, and two, because it will help uh, reduce global conflicts. So organic agriculture started out as a response to these sorts of problems. And uh, until uh, uh, the year 2000, organic agriculture was defied, uh, defined by a number of certifiers in the US, 44 or so. And then uh, in the year, two, uh, year 2000, the USDA came up with national organic standards that defined uh, how organic agriculture um, was to be implemented in this country. And uh, I'll tell you right now, just to get ahead of things, that uh, genetic engineering of plants was prohibited by the uh, national organic standards. So this is my farm at UC Davis. And uh, it, it's an organic farm. And organic farming is, is really based on the idea of health. Uh, health of the crop, health of the, the plants, uh, health of the soil, health of the farmer, health of the consumer, and it, 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 it's an ecologically based farming system. When um, one of the reasons that organic agriculture uh, um, reduces pesticide use is because it uses completely different strategies. It, um, instead of using toxic materials to, uh, uh, to control pests, uh, organic farmers use uh, crop rotation. They, they, they enhance beneficial insects. Uh, they use resistant varieties. Um, and they use some naturally occurring pesticides. But overall, organic agriculture uses 90% fewer pesticides than uh, conventional systems. So in this slide, you can see that we have a lot of crop diversity in a small space. And that, that helps to um, minimize the, uh, the impact of, of pests. The other aspect of organic agriculture that's important is that we have uh, another way of fertilizing, aside from uh, soluble fertilizers. Uh, this is a slide of our, our, our compost turner turning the compost pile uh, at the farm. And while presently compost is uh, defined by the USDA organic standards as, uh, as being um, uh, a material that is uh, turned five times in 15 days and reach, reach, uh, reaches temperatures between 130 and 170. Uh, the point of that is mostly, um, mostly to manage human pathogens. But compost on the farm uh, is intended to, pr uh, to provide nutrients like NPK and a lot of micronutrients, but also provide to provide uh, organic matter for the soil that helps uh, reduce erosion and uh, provides a, uh, a microorganism community that helps uh, to uh, suppress diseases and other pests. The other way that organic farmers provide, in this case, particularly nitrogen for uh, for the crops is through the use of cover crops. Um, this is our, this is a field where we planted uh, vetch and bell beans last, last fall. And this crop grew and um, uh, through the use of uh, legumes, 
uh, which have a symbiotic relationship with, uh, with, uh, with a uh, rhizobium bacteria that's able to fix nitrogen out of the air uh, and bring it into the plant. Uh, when we turn this crop in, it fixes the equivalent of 150 pounds of nitrogen uh, per acre. Now, the, the, um, the two-edged sword about organic about organic uh, fertilization is, on one hand, these organic nitrogen uh, sources, cover crops and, and compost, are much less uh, soluble than uh, synthetic nitrogen. Um, in fact, although that um, cover crop fixed 150 pounds per acre, only about 20% of that is available in the first year because the nitrogen needs to be um, broken down. The organic nitrogen needs to be broken down by microbes in order to be made available for plants. And it's the same for the compost. So it's a two-edged sword. It's not as soluble, but there's also less nitrogen that's immediately available to the plant. So you might ask if organic agriculture has has solved all those problems, solved the problems of uh, erosion and nitrogen use and uh, pesticide use. Is it enough? You know, is that, um, has that solved the problem uh, enough that we can look to the future and say, well, we just want to use organic agriculture? Well, there are a few issues that make that more challenging. One is that there are some pests, diseases, and, and stresses that are difficult to address using organic methods. Um, there are viruses that are very hard to control. Um, there, we, we have uh, this little pest on the farm called symphylins, which like high organic matter environments, and they eat the roots of most crops. And there, it's, it, we, uh, there really isn't a, a control these days an organic uh, control for uh, symphylins. There, there are also environmental, environmental stresses uh, like drought and flooding and uh, salty soils and uh, cold that limit yield and suppress yield throughout the world in different environments. The other challenge is that today, about 3.5% of U.S. agriculture is organic. That leaves 96.5% that needs to be changed. And, and uh, based on the rate of change uh, in the last 20 years, um, it's going to be, a, it, it would be a while before um, everyone transitioned to organic. And uh, it would, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's going to happen soon enough. Uh, the, other, the other problem is that it, if you look at yields of organic farms, there have been numerous studies comparing organic and conventional. And it's, a, it's actually a challenging thing, uh, thing to do. But um, if you look at these studies, the yield of organic crops ranges from 45% to 97% or even more of conventional systems. And as an organic farmer and farm inspector, I've seen a lot of crop fields, organic crop fields. And you know, most of the time, I think that the yields are very comparable. There are some very good organic farmers, and they do a very good job. But there are two, well, I've also seen some crops like organic rice, where due to the weed problems, the yields are regularly 50 to 80 percent of conventional rice. And you know, uh, that's, uh, that's a serious crop loss there. Um, the other issue, if trends uh, continue like they are now, is that Organic food is significantly more expensive than conventional food. And it may um, cause a lot of problems for 
low-income uh, consumers both here and throughout the world uh, if, if prices remain that, that high. But even if we could fine-tune organic agriculture so it could have the same yields as conventional agriculture, there's still a big problem. And that problem is, is that the population on Earth is still going up. Uh, it's estimated by 2050 that there's going to be almost 3 billion more people on Earth. So we need to have an agricultural system that essentially on the same amount of land or even less land if it continues to be degraded, we have to produce uh, much more food. And it's true that, that if um, we became, all became vegetarians that uh, a lot of the corn and soybeans that are grown in the U.S. could be used for other purposes. But it's uh, disconcerting, I guess, to me that if you look around the world and you look at India and, uh, and China, for example, as they become more affluent, they want to eat more meat. And uh, it seems like the demands on the food supply are going to be increasing greatly in the next 50 years. But even today, in, in, uh, in 2008, there were food riots this year in, in Haiti. There were food riots in, in Bangladesh. And the UN, you know, views uh, potential food crises as uh, something that's going to threaten the security of the world. So is there more land that could be farmed? This is a, a hillside in Ecuador that's being farmed. And as a Central Valley California farmer, I would have said that, whoa, that's not land that you could farm. <laughs> but, the, but there you go. People are farming it. And if, if we, without uh, additional yield increases, maintaining just what we eat now would, would necessitate a doubling of the world's crop area by 2050, that land doesn't exist. Uh, we need to increase our yields on our existing cropland. One of the other ingredients of agriculture, of course, is, is water. And we haven't been uh, using water in a very sustainable way. This is a, uh, a graph that shows the fresh water availability per head of world population. And you can see that in, since 1950, we're under attack by insects. <laughs> since 1950, the availability of water per head has decreased fourfold. So there's le uh, and as the population continues to increase, there is uh, less and less water available. Um, uh, in the U.S. and around the world, there have been underground aquifers, you could call it fossil water, that have been tapped into for the past 50 or so years. And that water isn't replaced. And so the, the most famous one here in the U.S. is the Ogallala Aquifer. And uh, the water level there has just been dropping and dropping and dropping. At some point, uh, it's just not going to be available to be used. But if you look at how water is used in the world, 67% of it is used in agriculture. And so <laughs> um, there's, not, there's not much more water that we're going to be able to access uh, to farm more land. We have to. Uh, live with what we have. And it's possible that uh, with global warming that water is a declining resource, even though the demand for it is going to be increasing. So given the, the immensity of the challenge to providing food for an increasing number of people while maintaining the integrity of the environment, we need, to, we need to consider the most appropriate modern 
technology that's available in order to solve some of these problems. And uh, Pam is going to talk about modern genetic approaches to that meet our criteria for a more sustainable agriculture. Thank you. Can you go on the green room and get the notes for me? <laughs> Thanks, Raul. So I, I think I'll start on a, um, a point uh, that, that Stuart began, which is looking at uh, the radical changes to our agricultural system over time, beginning 10,000 uh, years ago. So the origin of modern wheat, modern rice, and modern corn began estimated uh, about 4,000 to 12,000 BC. And the progenitors of these modern varieties are in Turkey, China, and Mexico. For about another 11,000 years, 12,000 years, not a lot happened until Gregor Mendel came along. And he figured out what um, our ancestors were actually looking for. So the important point here is that the seed contains all the traits that the farmer um, needs, such as yield, um, drought tolerance, pest resistance, disease resistance. But until Gregor Mendel discovered the principles of genetics, it was unknown um, how to take advantage of scientific information to do directed breeding. Since that time, there's been many scientific advances. So for example, in 1900, hybrid maize production began and with vast increases in, in yields of maize. There have been other types of um, modern methods, such as X-ray mutation breeding, which introduces random mutations into the genome, which is the collection of genes. Uh, which has led to some valuable crops, such as grapefruit, was induced by X-ray mutagenesis. And most of these, or I'd say all of these advances have been accepted by the population. However, in 1993, the first genetically engineered crop was improved for commercial release, and there's been a lot of discussion since then. Some people think that genetic engineering is just the natural next step in human domestication of crop plants. Others believe that it's completely unnatural. So I, I want to just go back to give you an idea of the kinds of uh, breeding that have occurred. So the Native Americans 8,000 years ago began with this um, wild progenitor of modern maize shown on top called teosinte. So teosinte produces about 10 to 20 seeds per plant. You have to break open the seeds to get at the nutrition um, inside with a hammer. And the Native Americans uh, began the first breeding experiments, and that has evolved to today to this uh, modern hybrid corn production, which is estimates to uh, produce about a hundredfold uh, more seed for each plant. So that means that we can use a hundred times less land, a hundred times less water to grow the same amount of food. Here's another example. These are all vegetables. They're actually the same species, so it just shows you the dramatic uh, genetic variation that conventional breeders have been able to achieve. And as you may know, nothing that you eat um, every day is found in nature. So everything we eat has been derived from modern genetic improvements. So none of these things are found in, in nature. So I want to just give a brief definition of genetic engineering and precision breeding. They, they and how they differ from conventional breeding. So genetic engineering and precision breeding differ in the way that only one to few well-characterized genes uh, are introduced at a time. So through conventional breeding, large sets of uncharacterized genes are mixed together through pollination, and the breeder selects those um, variants that behave well in his or her hands. The other major difference, and this is, I think, more where um, much of the concern is, is that with, with genetic engineering, genes from any species can be introduced. So you can put a bacteria gene into a plant species. Precision breeding is, has a similar result as genetic engineering, where you can introduce essentially a single gene into a plant. However, that process uses pollination. 
And this just shows you graphically the way we scientists think about it. So the yellow is one plant variety, and the red is another plant variety, and the colors represent all the genes in the genome. And pollination is across. And um, on the right is the checkered offspring. So you could see you have large sets of genes that are mixed together in the offsprings. And the breeder will further carry out further selections to um, refine this approach. Genetic engineering precision breeding takes um, the variety of interest, usually a locally adaptive variety favored by farmers, and introduces us one to, to a few genes. So those essentially are the differences. And I want to address the very first criterion that was high on our list, are genetically, crop, genetically engineered crops safe to eat and safe for the environment? So here, the science is in. So there's been over a billion acres of genetically engineered crops planted. We know that at least for the crops that have been commercialized, I'm not talking about everything in the pipeline, but those that are commercialized, those that you are eating today, and about 60% of processed foods contain some genetically engineered ingredients, you're safe. You don't need to worry. There's not been a single case of adverse health or environmental impacts from any genetically engineered crops that have been grown over the last 10 or 15 years over greater than a billion acres. There have been numerous um, the scientific uh, societies that have looked at this, not only in the United States, the National Academy of Science, but the Royal Society in the United Kingdom, uh, the, the prestigious societies in India and in Mexico and China and Brazil. And they virtually all come to the same conclusion that the crops on the market now are safe to eat and that genetic engineering presents similar risks as conventional approaches of breeding. Anytime you develop a new variety, you're going to have some low level of risk, and there's some examples. So for example, um, there's a, a celery variety that was developed through conventional breeding. The farmers loved it because it was highly resistant to an insect pest, and the consumers loved it because they can buy it cheaper. It tasted exactly the same. However, there were few farm workers that developed some rashes when they were picking um, the celery. So there always will be some low level of unintended consequences. But the point here is that it's similar but, um, whether you use the process of genetic engineering to introduce genes or if you introduce genes through conven conventional approaches. Still, it's important to remember that every new variety has to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. And um, we, we need to use the most appropriate technology. Sometimes a genetically engineered crop will be the most appropriate approach for a particular problem, sometimes not. So now I want to give you three um, examples to, to give you an idea why scientists are so excited about this technique. So this is the cotton bollworm. He's emerging from his egg case. And um, this little, cute little insect here <laughs> is uh, a big problem. It, it attacks cotton all over the world. And 25% of all the insecticides used in the world are used to control this pest. In the United States, we use about 15 insecticides to control this pest. Half of those are known or poss possible carcinogens. So this was a good target for genetic engineering. Now, uh, there, was, there has been a variety uh, that is resistant for this pest, and it was developed through genetic engineering by introducing a protein called Bt that is a favorite of organic farmers. So organic farmers love this protein because it is not toxic to humans. It's not toxic to other animals either. And it's actually very specific for this class of insects. So. This has been, um, uh, this is one of the first genetically engineered crops that's been introduced, and it's, it's probably the most widespread. And there's also the most study on this. So we know that in Arizona, farmers were able to achieve the same yield as, uh, same cotton yield as their neighbors who are conventional farmers. However, they use half the amount of insecticides, and in their fields, they have um, dramatically enhanced biodiversity. And that's easy to understand because they're not spraying as many insecticides, so you're going to have um, more diversity of ants and beetles, so how, which, which were um, species of these were counted in this particular study. In India, an 80% increase in yield was observed in farmers' fields. And in China, 
within the first um, year or so, insecticide use fell by 156 million pounds per year. So to give you an idea of how much insecticide is not being sprayed into the environment, that's almost equivalent to all the pesticides that we spray in California every year. And uh, researchers have found that insecticide-related illnesses have dr dropped by 75% on these farms using genetically engineered cotton. So again, you think, well, problem solved. But we can't simply rely on seed. As Raul, I hope, made clear to you, farming practices are, are very important. And we know that in some instances, instances, such as in China, after seven years of growing genetically engineered cotton, other types of pests appeared. And this also is predictable because the farmers quit spraying insecticides, so um, they're getting other pests. So there needs to um, develop other types of methods, um, organic methods, such as um, pheromone control of these other insects. And really, we need an integrated pest management approach to take advantage of these new seeds that are, are being developed. The second story I wanted to tell you about is papaya. So plants, like humans, get sick. They get diseases. They get viral diseases. And this is a picture of papaya. And you can see on the top these sort of little spots. And these, this is a papaya infected with papaya ring spot virus, which is a devastating disease. And most of the, well, virtually all the papaya that we get in California comes from Hawaii. In the 1950s, the entire crop of papaya in Ohio was destroyed by papaya ring spot virus. The farmers, uh, who are mostly um, quite poor farmers, many from the Philippines, there was no way to combat this disease. So uh, they moved to another island. The entire production was moved to the island of Hawaii. However, in 1992, the virus was discovered in Hawaii. By 1995, the production plummeted. And we were looking at the end of cheap papaya in California and a uh, lack of um, income for these papaya growers. But there's a hero to this story. This is Dennis Gonzalves. He's a local Hawaiian who was trained at Cornell. He was aware of this problem. And it, it had been predicted for many years by plant pathologists that th eventually this virus was going to move. So you're familiar with the swine flu pandemic. Um, these things get around. So in the early days of genetic engineering, he um, took a snippet of a mild strain of the virus and inserted it by genetic engineering into papaya. So this is similar to um, human immunizations or vaccinations against polio or smallpox where we're immunized with a little bit of, of the virus. This was um, a dramatically effective approach. This shows you a field trial in 1995. In the center are the genetically engineered papaya. And on the outside are the identical papaya, except lacking this snippet of um, viral nucleic acids. So this just shows you, the first arrow shows the introduction of the papaya ring spot virus. You can see this dramatic reduction in yield of papaya. In 1998, when the genetically engineered papaya was released to farmers, uh, there was a, a huge increase in production. And this just shows two um, graphs, which is uh, one area in Hawaii, Puna, and a, a larger area. So uh, I think this is important because this is an example where genetic engineering was the most appropriate technology to address a very serious problem. There was not an organic approach to solve this problem, nor was there a conventional approach. There's nothing you can spray <laughs> to control this virus. And so now about 90% of the papaya is transgenic. So if you get papaya for breakfast, it's, it's likely transgenic papaya from Hawaii. So now my third example is rice. So rice is a staple crop for half the world's people. Uh, about 20% of our caloric intake uh, is uh, derived from rice. And rice grows on virtually every continent except Antarctica. And this shows a typical meal in Mali, people cooking their rice. Many people get um, eat rice three times a day. So any improvements we can make in rice, um, uh, rice yields will have a dramatic impact um, throughout the world. So most rice farmers have very small farms, and they have very low, little technology. So this is a field outside Alexandria, Egypt. 
and here is a field in Indonesia. 25% of the world's rice is grown in flood-prone areas, and here is circled um, some areas that are hardest hit, in Bangladesh, eastern India, Burma, Thailand, some parts of Nepal. Uh, the water rushes down from the Himalayas, and you can get flash floods that are entirely unpredictable. And if they completely cover the rice, the rice will die in three days. So rice likes water, but it doesn't like to be completely submerged because the water cuts off the oxygen, uh, the gas exchange, and the sunlight. So this is a, a major problem, especially because in this area, there's 2.2 billion rice consumers, and 75 million of those consumers live on less than a dollar a day. So in India and Bangladesh alone, 4 million tons of rice, enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year to floods. So my colleague, uh, David McKill, at the International Rice Research Institute, knew of a wheat or rice variety that had been discovered 50 years ago in eastern India that was highly tolerant to submergence. And breeders had been very interested in this variety, but they failed to, and they tried conventional breeding to introduce this trait into locally adapted varieties, but the farmers rejected all the varieties that they received. And it, it, it um, was difficult to do the breeding because it was considered to be a, a complex trait, and um, the varieties that, that were developed just did not satisfy uh, the local tastes and yield requirements. So Dave um, came to my lab about 15, almost 15 years ago, and we had just um, isolated a, a disease-resistant gene from rice, and he asked if we would um, try to isolate this gene encoding this submergence tolerance trait that we called sub-1. And his plan was to use that genetic information to introduce this gene into locally adaptive varieties. So. Um, we were able to isolate the gene a couple years ago, and uh, using that genetic information we generated in the lab, Dave McKill's team at the International Rice Research Institute developed some submergence tolerance varieties. So this is a time-lapse sequence that I'm going to show you um, that was taken at the International Rice Research Institute. So it's four months condensed into 40 seconds. So here you can see on the left, is a sub-1 variety. So it's been planted, and you can see both varieties are doing quite well. But then in day 25, this terrible flood comes. And you can see after the flood, only the sub-1 variety is, is thriving. The conventional variety on the right, R64, is having a much harder time at recovering from this stress. This is a typical environmental stress. In this case, it's flooding. So. We, um, this is a field trial, and so a field trial is something that's carried out in controlled conditions. In this case, it was in the Philippines in a controlled field station. But Dave, uh, Dave's group has great uh, collaborations in Bangladesh and India, and he was able to uh, bring the seed into farmers' hands in those countries and uh, looked at uh, how the seed actually performed in farmers' hands over three years. And they found that the farmers found three to five-fold increases in, in yield, and that's because in every one of those years, there was terrible floods. It's expected that flooding is going to be increased uh, uh, due to global climate change. So I was fortunate last November to, to visit India and Bangladesh with uh, the team of scientists that were involved in this project, and we interviewed some of the farmers to see what they had to say. So they speak a dialect um, called Orissa in this part of India. And, uh, sorry, that was um, Bangladesh, but they speak the same dialect in India, in this eastern part of India. And so we also had this great conversation in India, in a tent, so the farmers were asking the scientists questions, the scientists were asking them questions. We had a lot of questions for them, too. So, so this tells us that the discoveries in the laboratory here in the greater Bay Area can um, be useful to farmers uh, 
clear across the other side of the world. And I want to just close um, to bring you up to date to, to where we are now. So this is uh, Arabidopsis. It's a very famous plant in scientific circles. It's a little weed in the mustard family, same as all those other vegetables that I showed you. And uh, it was the first crop genome to be sequenced. So that means that uh, all the genes in this organism have, were decoded. And there have been dramatic advancements in plant genetics even since 2000 when this first, Arabid, uh, when this first plant genome sequence was decoded. So for example, in 2000, when we first got the Arabidopsis genome sequence, it was estimated to take seven years, $70 million, and 500 people to do this. Well, now it's estimated by 2010, the same exact project will take two to three minutes and $70. This is a huge advancement. Since that time, we've also had the sequence of the rice genome, and that greatly facilitated our work in developing submergence-tolerance rice. And we now have dozens of plant genome sequencing projects um, that are ongoing. So what are we going to do with this knowledge? Well, it seems to me nearly inevitable that genetic engineering will play an increasingly important role in agriculture. The question really is not whether or not we should use genetic engineering, but more pressingly, how we should use it, to what responsible purpose. Agriculture needs our collective help and all appropriate tools if we are to feed the growing population in an ecological manner. And you, the consumers, have a significant opportunity to influence what kinds of plants are developed and to address the key agricultural challenges. So we need to direct our attention to where it matters. Uh, we need to support the use of seed and farming methods that are good for the environment and good for the consumers. So I want to give you an example um, where we can move forward with this new knowledge. So this, w I talked about rice, wheat, and maize, which are the major staples of the human population. But the fourth one, which you may not realize, the fourth staple crop is banana. In eastern Africa, 100 me million people rely on banana as a staple food for source. However, now there's a pandemic attacking banana. It's called banana wilt. It attacks all varieties of banana, and it's causing com com complete crop loss. Every year it's advancing. Conventional breeding is not an option because bananas are generated through tissue culture, not through conventional pollination. So this is an example where um, we hope that modern genetic knowledge can be used to uh, develop resistant varieties. So one idea is to introduce a rice gene into banana and see if that will um, develop resistance to this very serious disease. So I just want to close by saying um, pitting genetic engineering and organic farming against each other only prevents the transformative changes needed on our farms. There really seems to be a communication gap between organic and conventional farmers and between consumers and scientists. Although with Obama in charge, um, we're back to putting science um, at, the, at the place it needs on the table. <laughs> The stakes are high in closing that gap. Without good science and good farming, we cannot even begin to dream about establishing an ecologically balanced, biologically based system of farming and ensuring food security. So I'm just going to leave you with a quote from Rachel Carson, who, uh, one of the most important environmental act activists of our time, who I think could be speaking about um, the genetic approaches that we're using today. Thank you. Well, I understand that there weren't any questions uh, about our talk, so <laughs> that's going to be it for the night. No, there's a few, it looks like. All right. I've got a question um, before I start sifting through these. Nice fat wad, thank you. One of the things I understand is that uh, mostly you talked about the sort of uh, pesticide avoiding plants like BT corn or BT cotton, but there's also the herbicide tolerant plants like Roundup Ready, this, that, and the other thing. And uh, the way I understand it is some of the crops like uh, soybeans, when they use the, 
uh, the herbicide tolerant soybeans, they don't have to plow every year. And if they don't plow every year, they're now getting no-till agriculture. And I, my understanding is that's good for the soil, good for the biodiversity, good for other things. Is, is that true? Yes, that's true. It's estimated that this particular approach, herbicide tolerant crops and no-till agriculture, is the use in 2007 was equivalent to removing six million cars from the road just in energy savings. Twenty-three percent of U.S. agriculture is no-till at this point. Okay, you're an organic farmer. Do you till? Oh yes. yes. Why? Well, we till um, mostly to control weeds, I would say. Um, so you got, your, you got your cover crop on there, and it's pushing nitrogen down into the soil, and that's terrific. And now, what, in the spring, you, you plow those under and, and plant the new? We would mow them down first and then till them in, yes. So, and uh, what happens to some of that nitrogen and other stuff in the soil when you till it? It goes up into the atmosphere, right? There is some loss to the atmosphere, that's right. But if you didn't till it and it was sitting on the surface, mm -hmm. there would be some loss to the atmosphere as well. Part of it, there, there are uh, many organic researchers that are trying to figure out how to do organic no-till. And uh, a good site to look and see what's being done is the uh, Rodale Farm. They, they, they really worked hard on organic no-till. Uh, but there are uh, lots of challenges. Uh, aside from weeds, there are pests associated with not tilling, and, and um, uh, one of the interesting things about no-till, of course, is that the way they provide, uh, the way conventional farmers provide nitrogen in no-till is by uh, injecting it into the soil. You know, they would use essentially the same fertilizer injector that I showed on the screen. So it's an interesting question, can you have no-till without synthetic nitrogen? Because if you use synthetic nitrogen, there's still going to be leaching and runoff from the field. Now, you mentioned Rodale. In my day, they were the holy of holies of, of organic uh, agriculture. They, they reviewed our book. Hmm? They reviewed it. And what, what did they say? Well, the re reviewer really loved the book, but we then entered an online chat session with readers of Organic Farming Magazine, and they weren't so happy. That's interesting. Well, good for the magazine for being ahead of its readers for a change. Usually, they're behind. <laughs> and it's, this is classic Rodale. I mean, I knew Bob Rodale back in the day, and uh, he was a revolutionary. He was, you know, going to be revolutionary uh, every which way, and this sounds like yet another way. Um, question here from Ryan Grant, which is who's where? Right back there, waving a hand. Who funds? Miracle Rice. Miracle Rice or Submergence yeah. Tolerance Submergence rice. Tolerance, so, you know, the, the good rice is the GE the good is rice. making. So working for, uh, on crops in less developed countries is completely different than working on corn and soy in the United States. The large corporations cannot make money off Bangladeshi farmers that live on less than a dollar a day. So all that work was funded by grants from the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We had a 15-year run of funding from the USDA. Thank you very much to them. And we also had funding from USAID. And the um, collaborations with the International Rice Research Institute is very helpful because they have budgets that um, these international institutes are, are funded by foundations. So we had free reign to develop these rice and um, distribute the seed to farmers, and they're being distributed through the regular channels in Bangladesh and India. So the farmers can do what they want with them. I mean, I heard some farmers say, oh, yeah, we're giving them to our neighbors. Somebody else said, no, they're selling them to their neighbors. Here's a uh, question from Richard, no last name. 96% uh, of U.S. agriculture is not organic. How diverse is the ownership of those two groups, organic versus non? How um, diverse is the ownership? Are there lots of, of uh, small organic farmers and a few big conventional farmers, or how does it play out? Well, there are, uh, a, there are uh, a lot of small organic farmers, but, but uh, the majority of organic food comes from a few large organic farmers, unfortunately. Uh, most of the 
The local organic food, of course, comes from smaller farmers, uh, but in a way it depends how you define that, too. Uh, as farmers in Yolo County have become, the organic farmers in Yolo County have become more successful, they farm more and more land, and they become bigger farmers, uh, and you could view that as a good thing. Uh, the, um, the issue of size is, uh, is a tricky one. I, I was... Uh, <laughs> Um, yeah, I, there's a, a sort of an implication that small good, big bad. Does that play out? Well, um, those <laughs> too simplistic, uh, I think. It's a little simplistic. It, 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 I think it depends a great deal on how people are farming. There's a lot of people in the world that need to be fed, uh, and it's challenging to make a living farming on a small farm. Uh, so it seems like it takes some um, economies of scale if you want to keep food prices down. So we actually didn't say anything about big or small in our criteria because we feel if we can address the criteria with any time we develop a new genetically engineered crop or a new farming practice, if we can address the criteria, maybe it'll be big, maybe it'll be small, and that that's really what matters. Here's a classic question that relates to price. Um, Mary Hodder asks, does organic food have more vitam vitamins and minerals than non-organic food? If so, does that make up for reduced yield and increased cost? What are we paying for when we're paying for organic food, besides some sense of, you know, um, I th um, <laughs> being part of something wonderful and deep and aesthetic? UC Davis is, is, a, is a place where a lot of nutritional research on organic food has been done. and. The, the main studies have shown that there are uh, more antioxidants in apples, in some organic fruits and vegetables. Uh, but to compare nutrition in foods is, uh, is really a tricky thing to do because you're often comparing different varieties grown in different places uh, on different soils. So it's, it's, it's a challenge to, to tease out um, what the nut nutritional differences are. I think what you, when you're buying organic produce, you are definitely um, contributing to reduction in fertilizer runoff and pesticide use. I so think this, this is a public good, not a private good yet. It's a public good. You're not going to be, there's no evidence that you're going to be healthier or your children are going to be healthier. At least not yet. No, well, they, uh, except in the sense that the environment is less contaminated. And and that's so very you're important. healthier, yeah. yeah. And, and, and if you're working on the farm, uh, it's a much healthier place to be on an organic farm. Okay, here's Tim Anderson with a challenge. Begins with false. There have been adverse health environmental impacts. Starlink corn uh, was, had a fungus toxin in every cell, and BT destroys uh, efficacy of one of the pesticides organic farmers are allowed to use. You guys so Starlink, up on that one? yeah, Starlink corn. Um, so BT corn, there's many varieties of BT corn that released. Some were approved for human consumption. Some were improved for animal consumption. So there was a mixing. So this is the other thing. You can't keep different seeds separate. I mean, it's virtually impossible, especially for these big um, um, crops like corn. So the the seed processors mix some of the the starling corn that was intended for animals with um, corn that was intended for tacos, and it came in the taco shells. And um, there was a big outcry, and people were very worried. Um, it's now been approved for human consumption. There, there were no incidences of human harm. There was human fright, but there was economic um, effects. You know, Taco Bell, I think, had to practically shut down, but there was no incidence of human harm. So the CDC, um, you can go on Wikipedia. Centers for Disease Control. Center for Disease Control. There was like 20 reports of people saying they were sick, and the Center for Disease Control is our um, premier epidemiologist, and they investigated all those cases, and there was no link to Starlink. <laughs> uh, I know there's a lot of other information going around, but uh, you've got to just trust me on this or trust Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 
BT destroys efficacy of one of the pesticides organic farmers are allowed to use was the other part of that question. Challenge. Well, you know, I think that what that question must be addressing is uh, BT is a bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, and uh, organic farmers apply a, uh, uh, a formula of that that actually sprays the, the bacteria uh, out onto the field and when insects ingest that bacteria, they ingest the toxin as well as the bacteria itself. Um, the toxin has been taken out of that bacteria and put into Bt corn. So one of the uh, concerns, uh, one of my concerns, one of the concerns of organic farmers is that the extensive use of Bt in genetically engineered corn is going to result in resistance to BT, and organic farmers uh, won't be able to use that tool, which is a wonderful tool. I mean, I, I use it on, on broccoli. You could use it on sweet corn. Uh, it's a wonderful tool for controlling a, a small range of caterpillars. So um, I think this is a legitimate concern, um, and it's something that uh, if you look at, if you try and uh, evaluate BT corn on a case-by-case -case basis, there might be situations where you say, you know, this isn't a tool that we would like to use. Or you might say, hey, this tool reduces pesticide use by 156 million pounds, so it's, uh, it's worthwhile trying to develop strategies to uh, uh, minimize resistance uh, uh, development. One of the interesting things about that is that if you have a diverse farming system, so say you, you're, you're growing BT corn uh, with other crops that have the corn earworm as a pest, like tomatoes and uh, their uh, cotton, if you're growing um, in a mixed cropping area, then there's always going to be a population of susceptible earworms. So the uh, the development of resistance uh, might be uh, reduced uh, or even uh, eliminated because uh, you have uh, a mixed population of insects. So in the U.S., Bt corn isn't as widely grown as Roundup Ready soybeans because the added expense of the corn is not always justified in corn growing areas. It's actually um, mostly used to control uh, European corn borer. And in some areas, European corn borer is a pest and a uh, serious pest, and the growers will, will, will buy the Bt corn. And in some areas, it's not. They don't buy the Bt corn. So maybe I can just add to that. There is good data on Bt cotton and exactly this situation. So. Plant pathologists have known for more than 50 years that if you have a really great pesticide, it doesn't matter if it's applied organically, in the case of sprayed Bt, or if it's applied transgenically, as in transgenic cotton, there's a high probability that the insects are going to evolve resistance. So this was a concern early on. So there was this refuge planting strategy, as Raul mentioned, where there's cotton that don't contain this Bt protein. And Bruce Tabashnik in Arizona has done a really great study and has shown there are now three cases of uh, where insects have evolved resistance to Bt. And actually, there's a fourth case that evolved on organic farms. But in terms of transgenic, there's three cases. They haven't actually caused a big problem. But in Arizona, there has been no development of resistance in the insects. And, and they, they can correlate the, the presence of refuges and genetic diversity with the, the um, breaking of the resistance. So it's another example where you really need to integrate. You can't get away from good farming practices. Um, speaking of corn and BT, the, I was surprised by something I saw in your book that you said that organic corn such as there is out there because the Bt is on the crop not actually in the plant that the, the earworms get into the corn and when I buy organic corn it probably has a nice live worm in there? Well my husband's corn at least, I don't know where you buy your corn. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a challenging pest to control organically. There, you, you, could, you could spray Bt on it uh, frequently. 
uh, you can, um, there's a, 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 a virus you can spray out that also controls the worm. You can put oil in the, in the, in the tips of the ears. Uh, but the uh, adults lay the egg on the silk and the earworm crawls into the silk after it hatches. So you, it's a small window to be able to uh, control that pest. Okay, a couple of questions, as you might imagine, relating to corporations and such. Now, both of you are not corporate, as I understand it. You used to be in the organic farming business, but are not now, is that right? That's true, you could say and that. You're not in the I've biz. I've worked in the nonprofit sector, and I have, no, have not had funding from any corporation in 15 years. Okay, but you're aware that there are some corporations in this business. Yes. <laughs> and there are some questions on these matters. Adrian Cotter asks, what's your take on GMO patenting? Should farmers have the rights to reseed from their crops? Uh, and Alexander Rose says, I'm fine with GE Foods, but not the big companies that do most of the development. How can we help make uh, open source GE? Uh, when Michael Pollan talked in this series a couple months ago, he mentioned that um, Monsanto and Syngenta and DuPont and so on were um, preventing research of uh, the effects of their seeds in the world um, and that this was hurting the science. And you said in your book that uh, there's some patenting issues where uh, academics like you develop these genes and then the corporations sometimes prevent them from getting out into the world where they're most needed. So what's your read on the corporate situation and what should we do about it? So the first thing you can do is support funding for uh, public research. So support the USDA, the NSF, um, and the USDA, because that's where we get this nonprofit funding so we can work on problems that are important for, for small growers um, that are not of interest to corporations and to growers in less developed countries. And you know, I should say that corporations have their place. I was just in the United Kingdom, and a grower there said, we want the corporations to continue to do their research because we want their seed, because they have good seed, and we want that seed. So, you know, there is a role for, for corporate research, but I think it's very important that the fruits of publicly funded research are made freely available, and there's been a tremendous amount of progress in this area um, just in the last five years um, with the Rockefeller Foundation and UC Davis um, leading the way so that now when um, discoveries uh, occur in the university and in many land-grant universities around the nation, there is an agreement that these genes be publicly accessible to less developed countries and that if corporations want to license these genes, they need to do it on a non-exclusive basis. So that it's been really good to see those changes. One other um, important thing about that is that the, there, there clearly are other entities that are generating genetically engineered plants to be used in, in the world. And if, if uh, uh, the opposition to genetic engineering is completely broad, broad spectrum, that it's against all kinds of uh, genetic engineering, then we're throwing out the potential to really um, improve agriculture around the world um, because we dislike corporations. And w one of the, the funny offshoots of so much uh, social concern about genetic engineering is that the regulatory costs of bringing out a genetically engineered crop have become very, very high. And what that means is that uh, if uh, uh, a researcher in a university develops a genetic engineered crop that saves the banana crop, that um, the university uh, itself is not going to be able to afford to, do, to get through the regulatory process without the help of a corporation because the expense of doing that has become so high that only corporations can afford it. Is that true in the labs in the developing world or here or where? Well, you know, that, um, that's another thing to uh, mention is that many, many countries, China, India, Bangladesh even, have their own programs of genetically engineering crops. And 
uh, they can uh, bring out crops. And China has, you know, one of the things that Pam didn't mention was that the uh, BT cotton that's used in China isn't Monsanto BT cotton, it's Chinese BT cotton, that they developed that on their own. Uh, so, um, you sure it isn't pirated? <laughs> well, I'm sure it is. That, but they're not paying, paying any royalties. We know that. Yeah. Well, I, I think in China is spending more on plant biotechnology than the United States. They put a huge investment, and one of the issues is they want their own genes, and the government is funding the research, and they will also fund the release and the regulatory requirements. So it's a much more unified kind of system. Until recently, there really weren't any. Um, large corporations, that seed corporations, that's starting to change. They are developing a seed industry, but in the past, everything was funded by the government, you know, by the people, for the people. You know, that, that, that said, um, I think that it was a mistake for the Supreme Court to allow genes to be patented. I can understand patenting. <laughs> I, I can understand patenting uh, a variety to say this is a variety we put a lot of um, investment in, a lot of time in, and we want to get our money back. But a variety, like a hybrid variety, uh, it's protected in a variety of ways, and I can respect that. But patenting genes just uh, doesn't seem like it makes sense uh, in terms of the, the public good. Be specific, I mean, sort of like get the philosophical sense that, that patenting genes is weird. How does that play out in, in the specifics of reality? Well, um, when you patent, uh, uh, the, let's say you patent the Roundup Ready gene, um, it allows um, the corporation to uh, protect that patent and uh, go after people that they think are violating. Uh, and they get that for what, 20 years? How long? About, about 20 years. I remember when right. Roundup Ready came out of patent, suddenly the price went down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on yeah. the glyphosate, which is the, 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 uh, the herbicide that's used that it's uh, against. Well, you know, the, the, uh, the BT gene, as an example, has been around for a long time. Mm. Uh, it, it, it seems funny to be able to patent the BT gene, whereas if you just patented this specific variety of sweet corn or cotton or... Or, um, or PVP. Or, well, that's, yeah, that's a separate thing. But, oh, right, there's, a, there's also the Plant Variety Protection Act, which uh, allows plant breeders to... Uh, uh, protect a variety that they've, uh, they've developed. But it's more open source, so other people can um, use that as, as pollination stock, right? So in that sense, it's open source. They can't sell the same variety, but they can breed from it. Well, farmers so. can breed from it. Actually, other, other seed companies can't, because they've, uh, the, the material's uh, protected, really, but. <laughs> Question from uh, Rick, nice yes or no question. Can genetically modified crops now be grown on certified organic farms? Uh, well, of course, they, they, they cannot. Um, That's my brother. He knows the answer to this question already. <laughs> <laughs> they cannot because it's not allowed uh, by the, um, the national organic standards. But it sounds but, like you're saying you want that change. No, but you know, there's an interesting um, there's an interesting research program that's being done at, the, uh, at Iowa State University by uh, Matt Liebman. And he's trying to, uh, he's, he uh, wants to develop a, a more sustainable agricultural system for the Midwest. Right now, the, the rotation there is corn, soybeans, or corn, corn, soybeans. And if you go there, it's a, it's a corn and soybean biculture. There's nothing else there. And so he's, uh, he's integrated ecological farming practices like increased crop rotation. So he's integrated a legume and a small grain into the rotation. Um, he has um, added compost and 
uh, uh, turned in cover crops. Uh, and he's, he's uh, even used some genetically engineered soybeans and corn in, uh, in his system. And he's come up with a, with a system that not only on the corn and soybean part out yields the conventional system, um, but also provides more income for the grower over that four-year rotation period. And so essentially, he's, um, he's developed uh, a system roughly according to the, uh, to the criteria that we've set up here that integrates more ecologically friendly farming practices into a system that uses uh, some genetically engineered crops. And so it's, uh, it's not going to happen within, orga within organic agriculture, but it could happen within the 96.5% of the rest of agriculture. And he's reduced pesticide use, um, herbicide use by 74%, and reduced soil erosion. So uh, the system's possible. We're advocates of certified sustainable. We want a new label based on our criteria. <laughs> certified sustainable. Bring it on. Um, Adam voices a question that I think is deep. Uh, will the acceptance of genetic engineering in agriculture lead to the acceptance of gen genetic engineering in animals and humans? Is that okay? That's a, that's a good question. I usually dodge that one by saying, I'm a plant biologist. <laughs> um, but it is a good question. I, I do think that they're actually independent streams with independent issues. Um, so genetic engineering of humans, there has been work on this for many years already. It's called gene therapy. The same idea, you take um, a good, if somebody has a, a particular disease such as um, cystic fibrosis, it's known, the, the defect in the gene is known, and there have has been gene therapy techniques to take a wild type copy of the gene, that's a functional copy of the gene, and use it as an inhaler, which is um, gene therapy, which is genetic engineering. It's not um, genetic engineering through the germ line in the sense that your children won't have that good copy of the gene. Um, but there are a lot of discussions about that. And there's also even discussions of, well, we can't think of anything good with this mutated cystic fibrosis gene. You know, your children die by the age of 20. Let's just, if we have the ability to fix it, let's just fix it. And, um, and then let's pass it on to our offspring. So I have my students debate these questions because they're very large ethical and moral questions. And, um, you know, I think you're, we're going to see a lot of discussion about that. Um, I do think that plants are a much simpler, um, ethically simpler system because we've been tinkering with them forever, and everything we eat is genetically improved. So is the, does it matter if the process is genetic engineering versus precision breeding versus conventional breeding? Does the process matter? Or perhaps what matters is the trait that's in the plant. And, and, and how do we decide whether we want that trait or we don't want that trait? And again, we, you know, we go to our criteria. Well, we want the trait if it satisfies all those criteria. Just like you could set up criteria for sustainable farming, you could set up criteria for sustainable animal production. And if there was a genetically engineered trait that would fit into that criteria, then it might make sense if it's something that uh, is uh, trying to maximize profit and, and uh, is, is not good for the animals, then it probably wouldn't fit into a sustainable animal system. I have a feeling that, that in a sense, we're extrapolating in the wrong direction. Because we've got Drew Endy in the audience here. He spoke in, the, in this room about uh, synthetic biology a couple of months ago. And I just spent a weekend with George Church and Craig Venter oh. talking about things they're doing with microbes and synthetic biology and so on. And, from the standpoint of stuff that's going on there, this is charmingly Simple. antique and artisanal. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys are doing is so conservative, you know, one trade at a time and these plants and endless testing. And meanwhile, there's people out there, students putting together what they call biobricks by the hundreds now and building new organisms that do new stuff. Uh, yeah. Now, that may, you know, generate some fears down the line. I bet it doesn't because it'll be like genetically modified uh, medicine, which we already take in vast abundance. We sort of get used to it because it's good for us. 
So I don't think it'll, it'll wash back and make things weird for, for you guys. Uh, but I think there's this weird habit. It's like the embargo of Cuba or something. We decided that there's something weird about genetically engineered plants and we're gonna keep thinking that no matter what. Uh, how do you go against a cultural tide like that? Well, we need Al Gore. Because <laughs> <laughs> much of the That United only gets States, you half the electorate and the other half hates you even more. <laughs> well, much of the United States did not believe the scientists. There was just, they did not believe the scientific studies that our Earth was heating up. They didn't even believe it when we, they saw the icebergs melting. And um, what's interesting in that situation, it was really the, the right, more the right wing, but the genetic engineering are really the same issues where the scientists are saying, look, the crops that are out there that are safe, there's an enormous potential. We're sequencing genomes, there's all this information. Let's use it. But in this case, it's sort of more the left wing that has this skepticism of science. Why? Because of the corporation involvement or what? Do you I think? think that's it. I mean, I have had a lot of discussions with people, and I think that the, the sort of the last resistance is because, well, I heard Monsanto does this. I mean, that, that's a really strong sentiment. Okay, here's a question that comes up a bunch. Kevin Kelly voiced it pretty well. Do you feel there's any advantage for farmers and consumers to label GMOs? If so, what should the label say? This, is your, this is your favorite okay. topic. So. so I thought a lot about this because I am a label reader. I loved it when um, the Center for Science in the Public Interest got the food labeling because, you know, I can read what is in there. Um, so I thought a lot about genetic uh, labels on genetic engineering. I, I know what I hate is the marketing. You know, when we our kids were little, there was GMO-free applesauce, and it just drove me crazy because there's <laughs> there's no genetically engineered apples. GMO-free olive oil. Well, there's no genetically engineered olives. It's complete marketing. So that really bothers me, and I don't like the term GMO because it's genetically modified organism, and of course, everything we eat is genetically improved, so that didn't work for me either. So what I, I feel um, would be really nice if we could really have complete information. So what pesticide residues are, are on this crop that I'm buying? Um, what, you know, is there Bt protein in the crop? I think that would be legitimate. This uh, food contains uh, Bt protein. Even that, though, is a little bit confusing. So if you take genetically engineered papaya versus organic papaya, so the organic papaya is infected with papaya ring spot virus. It has tons of, of viral RNA and DNA. And you take genetically engineered papaya, it has trace amounts of viral DNA. So well, what do we do then? Do we have to label the organic papaya as this, con this is infected with vast amounts of viral RNA and protein. <laughs> but it would just scare people because the organic papaya is fine to eat. That, it's, a, it's a plant virus, it's not an animal virus. So it's, it's pretty complicated. I mean, maybe eventually we can go to some kind of barcoding system so everything we want to know is printed out for us. On that label, we always have to cut off the fruit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Speaking of, yeah, we're against that, right? Um, speaking of papayas, my understanding is that in Hawaii, where they've uh, got the GE papayas that you know keep the ring spot virus at bay, but you can also get organic papayas in Hawaii, which they uh, plant in the middle of the GE plantations, so that the virus can't get through all of those GE papayas to the <laughs> special yes, organic. And then they ship it to Japan for ten times the cost. Yeah. Now that. Organic does, is a marketing scam to some extent. Well, I mean, it, it was, it, um, we actually visited Hawaii last year and we, we visited some organic growers huh. and we visited some uh, conventional growers of papaya. And it was the organic grower that we, one of the organic growers we visited was just the, you know, the, the nicest, friendliest, open-minded, hardworking guy that you could imagine. But you go out into his, um, his fields, his orchards, and you see he's got a diverse crop system, many different fruits, but you get to the papaya, and you look at it, and you go, 
what's that yellowing up there? Oh, well, that's the virus. And, and he says, you know, I, I'll probably get a few fruit off of that, but the papaya should last, uh, you know, a number of years. I'll get a few fruit off of that this year, and then it'll die. And so you can grow the fruit, but the yield on it is uh, reduced a great deal. And it was, it was just sobering to see that, like, oh, well, this is, you know, this is a real problem. And, and the other funny thing about, um, about pap uh, papaya production that we saw there was that in Hawaii, where they were growing papaya, there really isn't soil. They're growing it in lava. <laughs> I mean, it's, if you look at it, you go, oh, there's no soil there. It was just, you know, ground up lava, and there were, uh, uh, in fact, when they plant the papaya plants, they put a little soil in just to have something for it to start off in. So it's, uh, it's a different world. One interesting thing about the papaya is he cleared fresh land thinking, well, you know, and that's a reasonable approach for plant pathology. If you plant where the virus has not been anywhere around, he didn't think he'd get it. He got it in the first year. And the problem is there's a lot of rainforest that's being cleared to plant papaya organically. So they don't have to use GE papaya, but when you clear the rainforest, you're contributing to global warming. So all these issues are so connected. Put that on the label. This organic papaya uh, caused the death of the rainforest. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Um, farmers are conservative and cautious. Scientists are cautious. What's the potential downside of this technology in your domain, in this industry? Uh, is there any, you know, you've sort of gone down a list of things a lot of people worry about that are actually, from your perspective, not worth worrying about. Are there things that are worth worrying about in this area? Um, there's always something to worry about. That's, I wake up every morning and I think, well, what should I worry about today? Um, she does, <laughs> actually, she does. <laughs> Even though there has not been really any negative unintended consequences with genetically engineered crops, and we have seen unintended consequences with conventional crops, I think it's uh, inevitable that we will see some unintended consequences with genetically engineered crops as well. Even though they are, they go through a regulatory process um, much more rigorous than conventional crops. Actually, conventional crops are not tested at all. You can breed something in your backyard. You can put it out. You can feed it to your friends. You can do whatever you want. Even if you're mixing wild species and um, whole genomes back and forth, there are no regulations. So some people argue that's why we haven't seen any negative effects with genetically engineered crops. Other people argue that we haven't seen any negative consequences because we know what we're doing, because we know what the gene is. Mm. Um, but I think it's also highly likely that they just haven't been around long enough. And I think that they will catch up if, if we do um, continue along this path with planting genetically engineered crops. There will be unintended consequences. It may be something like I mentioned with the celery, some sort of, um, you know, un unexpected allergy in farm workers. Um, it may be the, the biggest consequence is it just doesn't, doesn't yeah. work. You know, the in funny thing is that, is that it's unlikely that it would be something like uh, an allergen uh, in the crop because uh, the, there's no regulatory process for a, a conventionally bred celery to come out onto the market. But there is an extensive regulatory and testing period for genetically engineered crops. So I think that the, the chances of something like that happening are greatly reduced. How about peanuts? Some people are allergic to peanuts. Can you guys make us a peanut that is non-allergenic? Yeah, that's a big, um, a big effort from several people, several groups now. And um, actually, Peggy Lameau at Berkeley and Bob Buchanan have developed a, a low allergenic wheat through genetic engineering. And people are working on peanuts. And I'm not up to date on the progress on that. You know, one of the, one of the points of, con uh, uh, of contention and, and, and problems that I, I can foresee with uh, genetically engineered crops is uh, their compatibility with organically grown crops. And uh, the same crops being grown on adjacent fields or in the area. And uh, for that to work, it's going to take uh, cooperation between 
organic and conventional growers. And they're, uh, depending on what crop it is and how the crop is pollinated, I think there are some real challenges there. You both have students. Do you have the same students at all, or are they a completely uh, separate uh, set? We've had some same Occasionally students. Occasionally we have yeah. the same students. It's pretty fun. Sometimes students will take my class because they know him or they know me, so they go work on his farm. So you talk about the future of food. What's the future of farmers from, and uh, genetic uh, engineers from your standpoint? Well, business is booming in genetics, as I mentioned. There's right. just incredible advancements. It's a very, very exciting time. There's discoveries, rapid rates of discovery. It's, it's very intellectually stimulating, and there's massive applications. So um, that's accelerating full force. And of course, we hope that more and more of the discoveries will be applied so farmers can use them. Does Michael Pollan complain bitterly that there's not enough young farmers coming along? Is that your perspective? Well, that's one of the things that uh, we work on at the student farm is to develop more farmers for the future. And um, it's, it's, uh, it's challenging because it not only takes the skills to be a farmer, it takes a significant amount of capital to be a farmer. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it takes uh, um, an attitude of working hard that you have to work a lot harder as a farmer than uh, you do uh, as a geneticist. As a geneticist. <laughs> I thought that's what you were trying to say. Yeah. You know, I, lower pay too. I was looking at my fingernails <laughs> as I came in uh, in here tonight, going, "Whoa, that is dirty." <laughs> How many people here are gardeners? And how many are raising vegetables and fruits in your garden? What advice do you have to these folks? Advice. Advice. Um, Come I, visit. <laughs> no, well, um, you know, raising your own food is, uh, is really uh, a wonderful thing, especially in San Francisco, because it saves you huge amounts of money over uh, of what you have to pay in the stores, and it's fresher, um, and it's as local as you could get. So, you know, that's one of the um, one of the solutions, if you will, for making organic crops more accessible to uh, low-income uh, consumers is to you know train people to farm. So you can uh, say that they're being they're doing sustainable ag right there to some extent. Right there. That's right. Yeah. And should they, uh, are there GE crops they can use in their garden? <laughs> ah, that's a good question. Um, no, it's really hard. Really? I don't think, well, it, it, they could plant. Um, oh, that's interesting. Good for you. Yeah. No damage yet to your children or anything? <laughs> Yeah, there's not that many home gardeners growing genetically engineered crops. The, you could get genetically engineered soybean, I guess genetically engineered potato, genetically engineered corn, anything that's, they have these terrible terminologies, deregulated, which means that it's gone through this regulatory process, it's on the market, you can plant it. But a lot of the um, uh, crops in the pipeline have not, they, it takes years to, to get to that deregulated status. So if Drew Endy has his way, probably people are going to be just bootlegging uh, and, and home brewing uh, GE crops any second now, right? <laughs> well, you know, the, uh, of course, for the commercially available GE crops in the U.S., you'd have to sign a licensing agreement and pay extra fees for it. But well, as, um, as we say in, in the <clears throat> underworld, fuck that. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, but, um, Actually, potatoes it, are vegetally propagated. You could just ask this gentleman, right. and he'll give you a little bit. And but you know, papaya in Hawaii is uh, another story altogether because uh, you can propagate papaya from seeds. So if you if you buy a genetically engineered papaya in the store and you grow it in your backyard, it's going to be resistant to the. Uh, oh, that's true. The uh, the PMSV. <laughs> PRS. And PRSV. Uh, and uh, a couple years ago, uh, some research, well, I'm not sure who it was, some people went around Hawaii checking the papaya trees to see 
the extent of genetically engineered uh, papaya on the islands, and they found a lot of genetically engineered papaya in people's backyards. And so the question was, well, uh, is it genetically engineered because of pollen drift, or mm -hmm. is it genetically engineered because people planted it because the trees live? And no big corporations were involved, so it didn't become a legal issue? Yeah, that was a really... Well, people wanted to sue the university. Yeah. So. It was a really... Sue the university. <laughs> That was actually a really nice story because it was funded by a $60,000 USDA grant, and it was before there was mm. these tremendous regulatory costs. So he just put a, um, a wire fence around his plot, and he developed this using um, government funds, and then he distributed the papaya free to, to farmers in the area. It was very um, simple back then. Let's do more of that. Thank you very much. Thank you.